All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual Undergraduate Scholars Forum. Uh, so great to see so many of you here. Thank you for getting up early and getting started. It's, we're gonna have a great day. A couple of small matters before we get started. Uh, please make sure you keep your camera on. Uh, we want to make sure we can see you and make sure you're getting the most out of the day. So thank you for that. Uh, please keep your screen on speaker view so you can really enjoy seeing each of our speakers. And do your best to keep your microphone muted. I'll go in and mute you if I need to, but it'd really help me out a lot if you could do that yourselves. So thank you. So once again, welcome. This year marks our 14th spring of celebrating students' achievements through the forum. Westminster highly values student research and creative activity, and we've designed this day to show off your great work. It's also very important to us that you develop professionally while you're at Westminster. So the Scholars Forum also gives students an opportunity to pr practice those professional presentations. For these reasons, we felt it was important to take a day and dedicate our time to celebrating student achievement. If you've participated in the Scholars Forum before, thank you. If you're new to Westminster, this is how it works. In the schedule, you will see that we have organized the day like a professional conference with many options during each time slot. Be sure to join some of the presenters and the poster sessions throughout the day. Uh, and be sure to check out the demonstrations by our engineering students as well. As you all should know by now, you've got a Canvas page. We also have the web page, uh, so you can get the Zoom links there. The goal is for every Westminster student to participate in the Scholars Forum at some point. So be thinking about ways that you might be able to present in future years. Not only does it give you the opportunity to, to hone your professional skills, it allows you to come together with your fellow students and support each other. So please take time today to enjoy learning from and supporting your classmates. And now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Rizia Barden. Dr. Barden came to Westminster from Kolkata, India, and she earned her degrees in chemistry and mathematics in 2005. She then went on to earn her PhD in chemistry at Rice University. She is currently an associate professor at the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at Iowa State University, where she is doing groundbreaking work. She recently received three awards, totaling $2.25 million to support her innovative research program in engineered medicine. Her work focuses on improving disease diagnostics and treatment including the use of immunotherapy in treating some forms of cancer. Dr. Barden is simply an amazing person, and we are so proud to claim her as part of the Westminster community. Please join me in giving a hearty virtual welcome to Dr. Barden. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Yes. I'm trying to figure out how to... Give me just, a, just one minute. Something is happening with Zoom. Someday Zoom is just unhappy with me and doesn't want me to share my screen properly. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. All right. well, Okay, good. So I'll, I'll get started. Um, Zoom is not allowing me to see anybody while I give my presentation, but hopefully uh, as, uh, as there are questions, somebody will speak up and I can stop and answer. Um, I don't know how the presentation mode is supposed to be. I'll just talk and if anybody has questions, you know, just stop me and it doesn't have to be a monologue. We can, you know, we can interact as, as I go. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. I, I have to say that um, over the years, which has been almost 16 years since I left Westminster, I've been planning to be back and, and, and you know, talk about my, my story, but uh, it, 
it, it's been a very busy um, few years and and I'll kind of navigate you know you all through what I've been doing since I left Westminster and how the you know my Westminster journey um, really led me to where I am today. Uh, so now I am at Iowa State, but you know how I got here is what I'll be telling you today. Uh, so how I started and, and why I chose Westminster, I think this is a important part of the story. Um, I came here from India um, really all alone. I don't have any family members here, immediate family members. Um, and I landed here five days before 9-11. So that was an experience, um, you know, getting here and not knowing anybody and, and you know, having that um, experience. Uh, but, you know, I, I have to say, I was received with incredible kindness and generosity, given the circumstances at the time. And, and every day I remember there were just so many faculty and staff who constantly asked all of us international students um, how we were doing, you know, if we were doing all right and how we were taking the, the situation. And, and, you know, having that as your very first impression of a university, it really, you know, changes your opinion about so many things. And that's how I felt about Westminster, a place where there are so many dedicated teachers and, you know, people who just care and, and they care about your, you know, personal well-being. And if your personal well-being is taken care of, you are bound to do well professionally. And that's how I see my four years at Westminster. You know, I came to Westminster because they have really incredible education in STEM and in social sciences. Um, I was also offered some scholarships, which really helped me through the four years. And, you know, coming from, uh, from India, from a different country, you know, I didn't really want to be in a big city and, and lost in, in some, uh, you know, two acre campus and not being able to find myself. So really just everything about Westminster fit the bill when I chose it. And these photos I'm showing you on the screen, these are actually my photos back in the day when there was no uh, iPhones or, or smartphones. So these were all paper photographs that I had to scan to put it on my, on my screen because I really wanted to share with you where I, you know, how I saw Westminster. Weagle Hall is where I stayed my first uh, couple years, I think, or towards the end, I can't seem to remember, but uh, I do remember being in Weagle Hall a couple years. Um, so I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what I did at Westminster um, throughout. Okay, slide is not moving. Okay, there you go. Um, so I got my BS in chemistry and mathematics, uh, just like Carolyn uh, said. And I spent a summer doing uh, research with Dr. Frerichs. He was also my chemistry advisor. And I spent also some time doing um, an internship at the USGS Research Center. Um, so, you know, it was a really good experience having these opportunities, uh, you know, especially as an international student, there was a lot of restrictions with what jobs I could do. So I was really happy to have these, uh, these experiences um, over there. And, and so from there, um, I also had a lot of other experiences right on campus. Um, so I was a resident advisor for a year. Um, I was also president of the chemistry club, which I actually founded with the help of uh, Bernie, whose photo I include here. And I did a lot of other things um, on campus as well, besides, you know, getting, of course, a degree. Um, and outside of that, I also had a ton of jobs on campus. I worked at the internship office with, uh, with Linda, whose photo also I include here. I worked at the campus bookstore for almost all four years um, with um, Randy and Judy and a couple of other jobs. And you know, the purpose of this slide really isn't to kind of give you a laundry list of all the things I did at Westminster, but really just try to emphasize that the college experience isn't just about getting a degree. You know, you have to be involved in other things because the critical skills you learn when you're multitasking and you're juggling multiple things, it carries on throughout your life and throughout your career. I mean, if I hadn't learned that in college, how to have full-time jobs while I get a degree and other activities on campus, I, I just don't think I would be managing what I do now, which is you know, my job as a, as a faculty, as a mentor, as a teacher, as a scholar, and of course also um, as, a, as a mother. 
And so that's why I sort of wanted to kind of bring out all the different things, the opportunities I had while I was at, um, at Westminster and, and everything sort of shaped uh, who I became. And, you know, there, I, I wanted to highlight this page, you know, some of the incredible friendships that I made at Westminster, you know, friendships that were for a lifetime. Um, most of these are graduation photos, again, photos that I had to scan because <laughs> I don't have any digital photos. Um, and, you know, just really good memories. You know, this is uh, right here in the corner. This is spring break 2003 uh, with some friends that I still keep in touch with after all these years. And so really just uh, overall, this was a holistic experience for me at Westminster, you know, from work experience to getting a great education um, and also having a, a very active social life that I tried to maintain at the time. So where did I go from here? You know, at the, I remember sort of deciding towards the end whether I should get a job or I should pursue higher education. And I spent many months discussing my future plans with uh, Dr. Fredericks and Bernie and ultimately decided um, that I will pursue a PhD in chemistry. And so I, I will say that both of them really helped me make that decision. Um, and I had offers at multiple universities. And um, again, the decision to go to Rice was also after some discussions with both of them. And I chose to go to Rice because um, I really wanted to get into nanoscience at the time. Um, Texas Medical Center was there. I wanted to do something in biomedical research. And so I ended up uh, going to Houston and I was a, it's almost like a cultural shock going from a, a small town like Fulton to Houston um, and, and being able to drive in, <laughs> in a, this crazy chaotic city. But I really enjoyed the five years I spent over there. And I, uh, there I, I got into what I'm trying to do now, you know, designing these tiny nanoparticles, which are super small. You can see some of the scale bars here almost 100 nanometer or smaller nanoparticles and using them in biomedical research for cancer diagnostics and therapeutics. So this was sort of where I started some of my uh, work I'm doing now. Uh, but you know, one of the things I, I really um, remember of RICE and it's always going to be dear to me is because I met my husband there. He also got a PhD uh, at RICE in applied physics uh, and he's here at Iowa State as well. And so that, you know, our journey sort of started there together. And then the next step was, what do we do once we graduate? So we both landed in Berkeley, California. So that was a long drive, almost a 24 hour drive, you know, getting to, from Texas to uh, California. And uh, you know, it was a no brainer. I applied to several postdoc positions. And when I got in Berkeley, you know, and I went and visited it just the, the, and the research uh, at Berkeley Lab was just, you know, mind-blowing, state-of-the-art facilities. It was just beautiful. And you cannot beat the views. Uh, this is actually a view from my postdoc office. So I had a cubby, and if I could just lean over my chair, I would be able to see the, the Golden Gate Bridge. So it was just a really nice and, and great two-year experience. I learned incredible amount over there. But I wanted to do something very different from what I did in my PhD. And part of the reason I'm trying to share this is because um, I, you know, I know many people who sort of start their research in one direction and kind of continue that path for many years because it is, it is tough to kind of change uh, research directions. But I wanted to do something completely out of the box, something I've never done before. Uh, so I went into nanoscience applications, but in energy, learned a lot of new skills at the time uh, energy storage, uh, specifically hydrogen storage, was a big deal for um, applications in, in hydrogen-run vehicles, which you can still see. There are many in big cities. Um, you see a lot of buses run on hydrogen, and sort of that's what my um, research was. So at the time, uh, after finishing two years there, I thought, okay, well, what do I do now? Um, how do I navigate from here? And um, after doing some thinking, you know, I, because I started my, my education at a liberal arts college um, at Westminster, you know, I always found teaching very inspiring. I had some very incredible teachers and, you know, going through all my career options at the time, I really wanted to go in that direction, but also keep a balance of, with research. So I landed at uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. 
and uh, you know it is really the music city of of uh, of U.S. It's just a really beautiful city, lots of music, and there's a, a show, ABC show called Nashville. If some of you have seen it, uh, and you know of course Vanderbilt is a fantastic program, you know top 15 undergraduate program, um, really good graduate program in engineering. And one of the big reasons I went there is because they have an exceptional medical school. And I wanted to you know, keep going in the uh, medical direction of the research I did in my PhD and some of it in, in, from my postdoc as well. And they solved the two body problem. So my husband and I both started as assistant professor there. I did in chemical engineering and he was in mechanical engineering. So um, again, it was not a difficult decision and we spent a good seven years over there so my research there, I thought it would be good to kind of share what I've done in the last many years. Um, my research really took a sort of position specifically um, inspired at Vanderbilt in patient-oriented biomedical research. And when I say patient-oriented, I really mean it's involving patient samples, patient cancer, cancer, you know, tumor samples. It's just really about how my research could benefit patients. And so in that uh, effect, uh, one of the directions I work on is designing nanoparticles for diagnostics and uh, specifically tumor models. And we work a lot with uh, patient tumors that are engrafted in mouse models. And we also try to design humanized mouse models. The idea is that you take, you know, blood from patients and, uh, you know, you separate out the some of the uh, cells out of the blood and, and put them in mice to give, make them into a temporary humanized mice so you can do immunotherapies in these mice and see what kind of you know, response you will get, which is very similar to what you would expect in patients. And you know, part of the reason this research becomes important is because this is really the first step before you would go into clinical trials with any sort of drugs. Other part of my research, which is also patient-oriented, is to design these patient-derived organoids, or PDOs. And the idea is that we take these uh, patient samples, grow them into these organoids, which are kind of like an organ in, on a chip. So it's like you grow these different um, organs in the chip, and then we do drug uh, discovery and try to figure out uh, using some of the techniques in my lab called Raman spectroscopy, which patient will um, respond to treatment before even you give that treatment to patients. So ultimately the goal is you screen all the drugs ahead of time in that patient's organoid, figure out using some you know, machine learning techniques, we are uh, collaborating with a few people here, and uh, you know, it gives you an idea of, okay, all these you know, patients will be responding to these drugs, not responding to these drugs. And then using that, we can go back to the oncologist and say, okay, our drug screening platform said, these are the drugs that patient will respond, these they won't respond. In the same uh, effect, we are also working with pregnant patient samples uh, to predict risk of preterm labor, which happens to be a pretty big, um, you know, issue globally, you know, result, result in, um, neonatal death. Um, and so we try to understand what is causing a very similar sort of idea, take the patient plasma, apply Raman spectroscopy, and try to do sort of a prediction model based on machine learning to figure out who will probably uh, deliver preterm, um, you know, and who are at risk of that. So we can go back and discuss with the OB that these are the patients based on our model uh, who are probably at risk. So this is where sort of I am right now. Um, you know, my journey at Westminster sort of led me to, you know, Rice and then to Vanderbilt, and then here I am with with this research. So how did I come to Iowa State? I thought I'll bring that in focus. You know, I started in Missouri, and and uh, I love the Midwest. So here I am after you know winding through the whole country. I am back in Midwest in Iowa. Uh, a beautiful campus. It's very cold here in the winters. I don't like that. Um, but other than that, I really like my, my life here in Ames. It's a small town, college town. Um, I just really like it. And, and um, when we got the offer in 2019, it was no brainer. We both had landed two positions with tenure. We are one hour away from all of my husband's family. You know, that was a big deal, um, you know, for us to be close to family. 
We are in a really good engineering program, top veterinary school, so I'm getting into large animal research. And I'm part of this institute that they started a couple of years ago called Nano Vaccine Institute. The idea is to you know, design nanoparticle-based vaccines for cancer research, infectious disease, veterinary disease, there's all, all these other new areas um, I'm getting into since my move to, um, to Iowa State. So really been an incredible journey since where I started and I couldn't have predicted any of it, but I can tell you that all of those experiences at Westminster, specifically, you know, trying to manage a full-time job while I did full-time uh, school, really just kind of helped me become who I am today because my life is extremely busy. And part of that busy comes from these guys. Um, I spend most of my time running after these two. Uh, Jonah is uh, six years old, uh, Ilan is four years old, and they are 100% boys, as you can see from these photos. They like fishing, they like to pick up weird creatures. I think that's a frog <laughs> in that photo. And you know, just uh, trying to keep a balance between my life now and, and who I've become, you know, all comes from these experiences. So at this time, I will happily take any questions anyone has. Thank you so much, Rizia. If Students, if you want to put questions in the chat box, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, there's a lot of exciting work going on here, and if you want to hear more about it, we have just a few minutes for questions. And I will do my best to monitor the chat box. While we're waiting, tell us a little bit more about, you said you have two budding scientists. What kind of, uh, <laughs> so what, what kinds of things uh, do you find your, your boys are enjoying? Besides the, the yeah, you said the fish and, and hook, slimy stuff. <laughs> um, I, you know, I will, I will say, uh, and I'm not trying to brag, but Jonah, he is uh, in kindergarten right now. Um, and he is already doing second grade math. So maybe he at least gets the math acumen from me and makes me really proud. You know, he's not very good at maybe other things, um, but he, he is doing second grade math. I don't know how, um, but yeah, so I am really proud of what he does. He plays this game called Prodigy, if any of the parents here have ever heard of it. It's actually a video game with math in it, and he loves the video game so much that it kind of inspires him to keep doing the math, so we keep changing his level of uh, you know, what level he can do. And he, yeah, somehow now he's doing second grade math and he's so good at it. Uh, Ilan is four uh, and he is still learning his ABCs, but um, <laughs> yeah, they, they do like science. We do a lot of, you know, especially during the pandemic, we did a lot of fun science experiments at home that I was able to share with them. And, and yes, they do like it. Jonah has actually been to my lab a couple of times, looked at, weird cells uh, in the microscope, you know, cancer cells and immune cells. And, you know, he, he finds that pretty exciting that mom does this cool research. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, we've had a few questions come in. Uh, one is uh, a couple of people would like to hear more about your techniques in modeling and about uh, the immunotherapy that you're doing with cancer research. Yeah, so the, you know, I work very closely with uh, oncologist and cancer biologist. So at Vanderbilt, I had a lot of collaborations. Of course, the Med Center was right there. So that was really nice. But here, I actually work with folks at University of Iowa. And I talk to oncologists constantly of what immunotherapies are already FDA approved for patients. And so the goal is, or they are in clinical trials. And so then I try to use those treatments in my mouse models. So everything I do is sort of kind of, you know, discussing with them, you know, let's say they say, okay, these are the new drugs. Uh, so for example, in uh, I'm working on head and neck cancer, where, you know, actually only 20% of patients respond to immunotherapies in head and neck cancer. So trying to, you know, talk to these oncologists, you know, they told me that there are these new inhibitors called CDK4-6 inhibitors, which they are combining with uh, immune checkpoint blockage. So I, I'm doing that in these mouse models right now. So we work with immune competent as well as these um, humanized mouse models. 
So that's sort of my immunotherapy research. Again, really have to talk to this constantly with the oncologist because I could do whatever research I want, but ultimately it won't have the impact on patient if I'm not interacting with, with the doctors. The machine learning is something I really came upon a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a new area of research, really didn't know much about. And then, you know, last year I landed a grant and it just sort of shaped where I am. And Iowa State has some really big key players in machine learning. So that part has really taken off here. Um, basically, what we do is we do Raman spectroscopy. It's an optical technique which looks at metabolites in uh, patient samples. So for example, it will look at proteins and lipids and DNA, all of those different phospholipids in, in, the, in the patient sample. And then, but, but it's very messy. You can see that little tiny graph. It's too many peaks, too much going on. So what machine learning does is takes all that peaks and kind of like concises it into most important peaks that are changing. And looking at those peaks that are changing between the different groups of patient samples, it's going to kind of make this little graph over here saying, okay, here's all the responders, here's all the non-responders. These are the patients that responded to drug A. These are the patients that didn't respond to drug A. These are the patients that responded to drug B. So kind of doing like a drug screening in patient samples. Being able to then go back and tell the, you know, your oncologist like, look, here's my model based on the spectroscopy we did on the patient samples and it's saying drug A is not gonna work on patients. And part of the reason why we do that, if you think about it right now, patient goes to the you know, hospital, they get a biopsy done and based on the biopsy, some pathologist sits there, looks in the microscope, gives some you know, qualitative assessment of what they're probably, what receptors they have and they give start treatment. Two months later, they're like, oops, I'm sorry, you're not responding to this drug bad news, but here's, here's a $10,000 bill you should be paying anyway, but let's start you on a new drug. And the hope is with this sort of modeling, can we tell that patient within the first week, you just, this is not going to work. Okay. So you need to move to drug two right away. So that's sort of where uh, this research is going. Um, and, and then the pregnancy research is something we actually started this year um, after I, you know, landed this NIH grant last year really based on, again, this machine learning model to predict preterm labor. So our goal is we're gonna actually design a, um, a score, a maternal scoring system. And, and hopefully, maybe one day, it'll be used in hospitals where all pregnant patients will have to go this scoring and they'll get this score saying, okay, this is your risk score of, of, of you know, when you will deliver or will you show signs of preterm labor, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, all of those. Um, conditions that uh, women face. I don't know if that answered. <laughs> Very helpful. Thank you. I hate to say this, but we are out of time and there are several excellent questions in the chat box. Would you be willing to take uh, email? Uh, yes, questions? absolutely. Okay. Oh, if, if really, have, really. You have my email, please share with students. I'm, I'm happy to hear and I'm happy to answer them as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, your work is just so amazing. And, and we have a lot of interest going there in that chat box. Everybody wants to hear more about it. Uh, so we'll, yeah, well, I'll, I'll connect you with the students and you all can chat offline. And that would be fantastic. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Rizia. This was just uh, an amazing presentation. And to know that Westminster students are doing this kind of work is so exciting for all of us. Uh, next up, we have our student presenter, Stephen Rogers. Stephen is a sophomore from Jefferson City, Missouri, majoring in history and minoring in security studies, museum studies, and music. His project grew out of his Westminster seminar with Dr. Mark Bolton, but as Stephen explains, sorry Stephen, he is actually the chosen host body of Winston Churchill, oh, and Winston Churchill's ghost. So please enjoy Stephen's presentation, Conspiracy, the Lucy, Tania, and Winston Churchill, here you go, Stephen. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all of you here at Westminster College. It has been my great pleasure to make an appearance here again, especially after 75 years away. I say it is something of a unique sensation to be shown modern images of a college campus only to see icons, statues, 
and images of yourself nearly everywhere you look. I dare say I made an impression with my remarks in 1946. At any rate, I was very pleased to be invited to come and speak to everyone again, though this time on a markedly different subject. In the time since I last visited, much around the world has changed. Even in the last year, the world has been rattled by a pandemic, changing life as it has been known to many, if not all of you. Divisive politics and concerning world events make their appearances in the news almost daily and with the decidedly rapid speed at which information now travels in this nigh futuristic age, the siren songs of disinformation have been granted an outlet to take hold in the minds of any who would dare entertain them for even but a moment. With the coming of age of the computer, which I must say has evolved far past the point of Colossus and also the advent of such technologies as the internet, I was all too inclined to take a peek into what has been written and said about myself in all of the years that I have been gone. Although it would be far too much to go into in the time I have been allotted, there is one particular accusation that has been leveled against me that I found quite surprising. There are many across the world who now believe that I was the one responsible for the untimely demise of the RMS Lusitania in 1915. Many of you may remember that the RMS Lusitania was sunk as a part of the First World War back in 1915. And thus brings me to what I have traveled here to speak about, conspiracy theories. I have very quickly discovered that in the modern day, there exists a rather plentiful number of theories and ideas which hold that certain world events since the First World War were the results of conspiracies orchestrated by seemingly all-powerful world organizations, governments, or otherwise. The assassination of American President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001, and indeed even the very pandemic that has been ravaging the world are purported to all have emanated from extraordinarily powerful world organizations for varied nefarious purposes. So what is one to do in the face of such a thing? Well we, are, well, we certainly cannot fault anyone who believes in a conspiracy theory for having asked questions. To question the established narrative of events and to want to bring to light any information possible are both far from ludicrous or insane. In fact, I would make the argument that critical thinking, itself much needed when considering most things, predicates itself on the ability of everyone and anyone to ask good, challenging, and thought-provoking questions. In this way, when approaching conspiracy theories, all of us who find ourselves curious about one thing or another should not be afraid to bring forth inquiries into the events that have supposedly taken place, as such is what drives the next important part of dealing with conspiracy theories. Evidence. Anything that is to be reasonably believed must be supported by evidence. It is here where we begin to find that many conspiracy theory believers diverge from critical thinking. The question itself cannot drive your answer in anything. It can only drive your research. However, your research must then drive your answer. As any good scientist can tell you, when the initial hypothesis is drafted and then the, and then the experiment conducted, Many a scientist has found that they were utterly wrong about what was going to take place. And when this does occur, it is their job to record their findings as they have found them and not simply just what they have wanted to find. Let us take the sinking of the RMS Lusitania, for example. Let us ask the question of whether or not I sank it. And then let us also examine the items which many people in the modern day cite as evidence for my having sunk it. Why was there a large amount of ammunition stored below deck that could have been potentially detonated? Why does the British government refuse to declassify certain details of the sinking to this very day? Why did the Lusitania sink so quickly when similar ships like the Titanic sank much more slowly? Why was the Lusitania sent through waters that were known to be infested with German U-boats? And why did the Lusitania travel at a slower speed through these areas? 
All of these are good questions. They are, however, only questions and do not themselves point to any answers. They only bring us to the next step, which is research. Although it would be humorous, I think, to have everyone in the audience perform their own independent research at this moment, time will not allow for it. As a result, you will have to take me at my word when I tell you everything that I do. But, self-serving though it may feel, I do feel inclined to remind everyone here today that I am qualified to make the following assertions in response to each question I have listed out. In response to why there was a large amount of ammunition aboard the ship, I am inclined to point out that, in 1915, the largest war humanity had ever seen up until that point was raging all across the world. Any and all ammunition, guns, or supplies otherwise were incredibly useful in fighting this war, and both factions would be wont to get their hands on as much as they could. In, responses, in response to the British government refusing to divulge certain details of the sinking to this day, I would observe that every government, to one extent or another, keeps secrets that are not to be declassified until, after, until long after an event has lost its relevance. There are a large score of potential reasons that those in Her Majesty's government today could have for keeping certain details classified. And although the world will not know for certain until those details are, are released, this means that it remains a question and not an answer. In response to why the Lusitania sank as quickly as she did, one must remember the destructive power of the torpedo versus the natural iceberg. The torpedo, having been designed for war, was able to punch a rather substantial hole into the, into the side of the Lusitania's hull. And one must then also remember that two of them were fired. Much more substantial vessels, especially in the Second World War, fell prey to but one torpedo strike. And the Lusitania, itself a liner in no way fit for war, was stricken by two. In response to why the Lusitania was steaming through waters known to be infested by German U-boats, one must remember that a war zone had been declared around the entirety of the British Isles, and had no shipping left Britain or entered Britain whatsoever in the time that this war zone was declared. Nothing, no men, arms, material, or otherwise, would have been able to reach it. The war would have been lost very quickly in that case. In addition, scarcely anyone aboard the Lusitania, including her captain, had a good understanding of submarine warfare, or indeed the damage that torpedoes could do. It was their opinion that the Lusitania would outrun any potential pursuer, and that it was so well constructed that no torpedo could possibly sink her. There are, of course, many other questions that could be asked, and that I have been and, and that I, and that have been asked about the tragic event. More than I have time to answer. However, I implore each and every one of you to do your own research. Look amongst the primary sources from the British and German admiralties. Look amongst the accounts of Lusitania's survivors and from her captain. Look upon what is written by various qualified historians and gather as much information as it is possible to gather. Whatever you do and wherever you look, however, always ensure that you are looking in the right places. The words of a historian who has spent years researching the topic, or the words of somebody actually aboard the Lusitania when it sank, or the words of British or German leadership at the time of the sinking, are worth far more than the conjecture of a 20-year-old extremist looking to make themselves popular. When examining a source, you must ask yourself these questions. Who wrote it? For whom did they write it? When did they write it? and what might their bias be? And should you ever come across a question you cannot find the answer to, always hold on to it. Never disregard that which cannot be answered, or it may prove to be the next groundbreaking piece of the puzzle. However, as long as the question cannot be answered, it cannot lend itself to the answer. The question drives the research, and the research drives the answer. I have great confidence in every one of you here today. It is my ardent hope that none of you will ever stop asking questions, but also that in every question you will ask, 
you will only allow them to drive your research and not your answer. So long as you do that, you can be assured a soundness of mind and a soundness for the knowledge you possess. It has been a pleasure to come to Westminster College again, if virtually this time. Thank you all. Thank you so much. My goodness, Stephen, that was fantastic. <laughs> all right. We have a few questions for the chat box. Anybody want to hear more? I quite like to think that everyone has had quite enough of hearing me speak. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us where this all came from. How did you how did you land on this topic, and how did you how did you come to um, become such a great impersonator? Well, if I am to abandon the Churchill persona for that question. <laughs> Then um, this entire topic came, it's like, see, my seminar in freshman year was, enti was on conspiracy theories. And the entire thing was designed to get people to think critically about um, various, ab about anything, really. Just because um, with the relevance of conspiracy theories in the modern day, um, especially with so many that we see cropping up now, um, the goal was to really inspire people to think critically about anything that they come across. And so um, there were presentations that each person in this seminar had to do on a conspiracy theory of their choosing. So um, I chose the conspiracy on the Lusitania. And whenever I chose this topic, um, originally it was going to be my intention to simply give a presentation on just the Lusitania as myself, as you know, anybody would, would, would do, but um, it, I, I eventually had the idea <laughs> that um, what if I gave this presentation as, uh, as Winston Churchill? And what if I um, just uh, shaved my head? Uh, at, at, at that point, I had um, a cigar as well. I had a cigar, uh, it's like a, an empty bottle of whiskey and everything like that that I brought with me. And uh, I just, and I gave a presentation um, on the Lusitania conspiracy as Winston Churchill. And um, so it was uh that was what really inspired this uh this this entire thing just because it was a lot of fun to uh to number one just dress up as winston churchill and just uh, talk like him to a, to an audience but then number two also get to talk about a topic that is that has a, lo a, a lot of relevance uh today and so it's uh, that is that's where the inspiration for that came great thank you we have a couple of questions uh, one is how widely spread is that conspiracy right now? Uh, is, it, is it still wide, widespread? So um, it actually has um, a, f a fair amount of relevance from what I've been able to tell, from what I've been able to see. There are actually friends who I have had in the past um, who have actually tried to make me a believer in this particular <laughs> conspiracy. And so it is, um, as for uh, how relevant in terms of how far, or how wide um, it proliferates, I couldn't give you exact numbers, but um, there are still a large number of people who believe it, including, um, though, <laughs> including my own father. So I mean, it's just uh, there are there are qu quite a number of people who uh, who who do uh, who do believe that the Lusitania was sunk intentionally by Winston Churchill. And when you look at, at, the, at the conspiracy itself and you look at like the different questions that are raised, I mean, there are some things that do begin to look suspicious. I mean, there are, I mean, I, in, in the presentation that I gave, there were a few questions that I listed out, but there are other things that are mentioned as to why the captain was immediately blamed for the sinking instead of the Germans by the British Admiralty. Why there were destroyers in a nearby base in Ireland um, that were not dispatched to come and escort the Lusitania um, as it was passing through this very uh, heavily infested area of German U-boats. And so it's just uh, whenever you whenever you begin to look at all of these different things, whenever you examine them without um, if you examine them without, you know, thinking about it any further than that, it almost, it looks very suspicious, very fishy. But the point then that, that, that I was trying to raise in the presentation is that whenever you look at that, the question is always, it's, it's always good to ask the question. Challenging an established narrative, although it can seem daunting, is something that, it, that can be very necessary to do. However, 
the, um, the question drives the research and the research drives the answer. The question cannot lead you, the question cannot directly lead you to your answer. Otherwise, proper research is not being performed. Very thankful. Okay, one last thing. Uh, a student asked, what sparks your interest the most in history? Oh, goodness. Um, well, um, there are a number of things that, that have really sparked my interest in history um, as a whole. And I think the biggest thing that really set me on the path to wanting to, uh, um, to, wanting to research history was, um, well, that's, it's, it, like I said, I don't know that I can necessarily pin it down to any one thing, but there are, there are definitely a few things. Um, I think it was whenever I was younger and I would um, see movies, for instance, of World War II or whenever I would play a, a video game or something like that that would have a, 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 a historical element to it or that would take place in a certain part of history, I was always absolutely fascinated by everything that I saw. And it made me want to know more. And so um, I, it, would, it would lead me down rabbit hole after rabbit hole. And many a night in middle school and high school did I stay up till 3 or 4 a.m. reading articles online <laughs> or reading books about uh, different, different subjects to just, uh, to just try and uh, it's like find out more about, about, this, about, the, about whatever topic it was. And so uh, I'd say that there were a number of things that definitely sparked my interest uh, in, in history. But I would say that there were uh, definitely a few uh, formative experiences that I had with it back whenever I was younger that definitely had a very pronounced effect. Well, thank you so much. We still have more questions coming in the chat box, but that's okay. Uh, I will get those to you. Uh, it's time for us to move on to the next section. Again, Stephen, we can't thank you enough. That was fantastic. Uh, round of applause for Stephen as we close this session. Thank you. All right, great. The final piece of the opening session today is the recognition of our students uh, for academic awards. And um, so we'll conclude with that. Uh, first up is Dr. Heidi Levine, who's the director of the Westminster Honors Program. Uh, Heidi, can you jump in now? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Perry. Congratulations to all of the student presenters today and to all of the award winners. It is the great joy of my academic life to work with members of the Westminster Honors Program who represent virtually every major on campus. And today we're going to recognize those students who joined the Honors Program this year, either um, as incoming freshmen or as transfer students, as well as those students who have successfully applied to join the program next year in their sophomore years. Um, so students who earn admission to Westminster's Honors Program must successfully demonstrate not only high levels of academic achievement and motivation, but also an ethical commitment to serving their campus and local communities and to using their talents to inspire and uplift others. Applicants are evaluated and selected by a faculty committee, and I'd like to take a minute to thank the faculty and staff members who helped me to evaluate all of those uh, applications this year. Those people are the Reverend Kiva Nice Webb, uh, Dr. Joe Morrow in biology, Dr. Bob Ames in business, and Dr. Jeremy Strawn of the Churchill Institute. So each of you will be receiving a, cert a fancy certificate, which I won't bother to hold up now in this format, but just know that you'll receive those tomorrow at our honors picnic. The students who joined the program this year, either as incoming first year students or as transfers are Aaron Carr, Jax Centrella, Tim Fitzpatrick, Jennifer Sella, Caitlin Huber, Marissa Hurtabies, Hannah Lind, Maddie Marrero, Ali Oglesby Watson, Ben Parks, Earthus Pasqua, Blaine Ravert, Connor Sherman, Lee Turk, and Shelby Weathers. Congratulations to each one of you. And <laughs> yes, and the students who will join next year as sophomores are Jonathan Bonza, Grace Ann Choate, Gracie Hamrick, Ayanda Huate, Paige Hurley, Fielder Ross Swai, and Matthew Trout. Congratulations to each and every one of you. Congratulations and thank you. All right, next up we have Dr. Don Holliday, Chair of the Department of Biology. Don? 
Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, so I first I would like to echo Dr. Levine's congratulations to everyone presenting today and those receiving recognitions. Um, I am going to announce the recipient of the Dr. Cameron and Mrs. Jesse Day Prize in biology. This individual um, criteria for this fund was established by those individuals in 1961. The criteria for the award are that the individual must be a senior majoring in either biology or biochemistry with a biological emphasis, has the highest GPA in his or her major, um, and has taken at least two years of chemistry and one course in physics. The recipient of the um, recognition this year is a member of the Honors College, member of Alpha Chi, the Pre-Healthcare Club, and Tri Beta, just to name a few. They've also worked at Camp Rainbow and have volunteered at two different hospitals in the St. Louis area. I'm happy to share today that the recipient of the 2021 Dr. Cameron and Mrs. Jesse Day Prize in Biology is none other than Ben Von Hoogstraat. Congratulations, Ben. Thank you. All right, congratulations, Ben. This is great. And thank you, Dr. Holliday, for showing us a future Westminster star in the background of your camera. Uh, nice to have him with us as well. All right, next up is Dr. Abby Coates, Chair of the Psychology Department. Abby. Good morning, everyone. And again, congratulations to everyone for all their hard work today. Um, I'm here to present the Margaret McDonald Yeager Psychology Award. Um, this is given to one senior psychology major each year to recognize their outstanding academic achievement and their promise of successful graduate work. The recipient will have a strong uh, psychology GPA and also will have demonstrated um, strong interest in the discipline through things like conference presentations, thesis work, or internships. Um, since the purpose of the award is to assist a student with educational expenses, eligible candidates must have been accepted for graduate study. This year's winner will be attending the University of Missouri St. Louis to pursue a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. So our senior 2020 winner of the Margaret McDonald Yeager Psychology Award is Anna Oliver. Congratulations, Anna. <laughs> Thank you. The Yeager Endowment also allows two psychology juniors to be recognized for their early achievements in psychology. And these students receive funds to help with educational and research expenses. The junior winners of the Margaret McDonald Yeager Psychology Award are Catherine Bloom and Doris Perlinchen. So thank you. Congratulations to Catherine and Doris as well. We're very proud of you all. Thank you, Dr. Coates. Thank you. Congratulations. All right. I'd like to recognize next the newest member of the history department, Dr. Heather McRae. Dr. McRae. Thank you. The Harmon L. Remmel III Prize for Outstanding Thesis in History is named after Harmon L. Remmel III, who graduated from Westminster College with a degree in history in 1965. Harmon was among the seven Westminster students who gave their lives in Vietnam, and his family established this award in his honor. This year, the department is proud to honor two students for their work. Sarah Ayers for her thesis, Mickey Mouse and His Lawyers, The Symbiotic Relationship Between the Walt Disney Company and Copyright Law in the United States. And Kyle Miller for his thesis, High Speed Aluminum Tubing, The Influence of Aeronautical Engineering on the Bargaining Strategies of the Airline Pilots Association. Congratulations to Sarah and Kyle. Thank you, Dr. McRae, and thank you to everyone from the history department. Yes, thank you, Dr. McGray. Congratulations to you both. All right, next up we have Jesse Reed, the coordinator of study abroad, to present the Cranshaw and Piper scholarship recipients. Jesse. Sorry about that. Pull this up. I'm happy to announce that the Study Abroad Scholarship Committee has selected Joseph Garner as the recipient of the Cranshaw Scholarship and Haley St. Clair as the recipient of the Vernon W. and Marion K. Piper Overseas Study Endowment Scholarship for the 2021-22 academic year. The Cranshaw Scholarship 
is funded by the Cranshaw Corporation of New York and donated by Zara and Daniel Harris for a full year of university study in the United Kingdom. The Vernon W. and Marion K. Piper Scholarship awards funding for one semester of study in the European Institution of Higher Education. Joseph is a local of Fulton and is currently majoring in political science with a pre-law minor. He wants to study abroad to both get a more comprehensive view of law in regards to different interpretations and how different systems lead to alternate positions. For his career, he wants to work in a government position as a bureaucrat and mainly wants to focus on creating and implementing policies or interpreting existing policies and their implications. Haley St. Clair of Monroe City, Missouri is a double major in transnational studies and security studies she desires to study abroad um, because it's a better way to learn more about the world than through traveling and experiencing it firsthand. She hopes to have a career in either the government, such as CIA or Homeland Security. She is also interested in working in global security occupations as well. Recipients of our study abroad scholarships are academically solid students who demonstrate achievement or promise in non-academic fields, such as organizational leadership, community service, or athletics, and who would most benefit from study abroad for an extended period. We are honored that Joseph and Haley will not only represent Westminster College at their chosen institutions of study, but will also help our community re-engage with opportunities through study abroad. Congratulations to you both. Nice. Okay. Um, up next, we have Dr. Callie Wright Smith, Director of the First Year Experience. Good morning. It is my honor to present two awards this morning. So, last year, we instituted two first year awards Outstanding First Year Academic Performance and Outstanding First Year Campus Citizen. It seems more than appropriate that we are doing offering these again this year because I can't imagine a more challenging time for students to be starting college than last fall. And in spite of that, our, our first year students demonstrated incredible resilience and flexibility and have already made so many positive marks on our campus. I get to work with a lot of outstanding first year students directly every single week and I see all of the ways that they're influencing our campus in very positive ways. So this year I had a lot of nominations uh, and this made my, my job very difficult. Uh, so consequently, I let myself off the hook by uh, awarding two uh, in each category. And even with awarding two in each category, it was still an incredibly difficult decision because of all the wonderful uh, nominations and really thoughtful and kind words that I received. So we have two uh, students being honored for outstanding first year academic performance. These students excelled academically in their first semester, but beyond that, they demonstrated a real passion for learning and we're committed to, again, really taking advantage of opportunities to grow intellectually and to expand their horizons in so many different ways. So the first person that I am pleased to recognize this morning for outstanding first year academic performance is Megan Davidson. Congratulations, Megan. The second recipient of our outstanding first year academic performance uh, is Matt Trout. And congratulations to you as well, Matt. For Outstanding First Year Campus Citizen, again, we had a number of really, really wonderful people who are nominated and all of these people I personally know have made their mark on campus in really incredible ways in their first year. So this is an award that really recognizes um, students who demonstrate care for their others, but also care for our campus community and really want to bring out the best in Westminster. So our first recipient of the Outstanding First Year Campus Citizen is Katie Wood. And congratulations to Katie. And our final award goes to um, our second recipient of our Outstanding First Year Campus Citizen Award. And congratulations to Earthus Pasqua. So congratulations to Megan, Matt, Earthus, and Katie for all their wonderful work in this first year and keep it up. Thanks, Carolyn. Way to go first year students. That's fantastic. Thank you. All right, next up we have Dr. David Jones, who is uh, not just a, a professor of psychology. He's also the faculty advisor to Alpha Chi and the Marshal of the college. So uh, Dr. Jones. 
Thank you, Carolyn, and uh, good morning to everyone. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and uh, present the new members of Alpha Chi, um, and then that will be followed by uh, the new members of the Skulls of Seven. So let me start with, uh, with Alpha Chi. Alpha Chi is a national honor society recognizing juniors, seniors, and graduate students in all disciplines, and it's considered to be the most prestigious national honor society on the Westminster campus. On May 8th, the Missouri Delta chapter will be pleased to induct 11 new student members and one honorary member. Students represent the top 5% of the junior class and the top 10% of the senior class. The new student members are Michael Ellinger, Hannah Fugler, Sydney Funk, Joseph Garner, Michaela Jackson, Ashlyn Laflame, Anna Oliver, Doris Permungen, Olivia Schroyer, Matt Trout, and Rebecca Zile. And this year we are thrilled to induct a longtime supporter of the Missouri Delta chapter and its students. That person is someone who has spent the last 40 years at Westminster inspiring students. The new honorary member of the Missouri Delta chapter of Alpha Chi is Dr. John Langton. So congratulations to all of our new members of Alpha Chi. All right, let me put on my Marshall of the College hat now, and I will introduce the, the Skulls of Seven. The Skulls of Seven, founded in 1898, is a mystical society dedicated to upholding the tradition, traditions and ideals of Westminster College. The members are students in good academic standing who are respected leaders of the Westminster community and who strive to put the college ahead of personal or special interests. The Skulls of Seven is a self-perpetuating body which encourages applications from all student leaders. The Skulls of Seven is an honor society that prides itself on commitment to seven virtues, tradition, history, scholarship, loyalty, and friendship citizenship, service, and honor. The Skulls of Seven are defenders of college tradition and are chosen for their adherence to the seven virtues with the duty of upholding these values. Six seniors and one junior are selected based on their proven devotion to the college and their positive representation of Westminster. <clears throat> this society has existed for over 120 years and is the oldest group on the Westminster campus. The continuing purpose of the Skulls is always and ever the welfare of the college. The members of the 125th August Society of the Skulls of Seven are, first of all, the Grand Marshal, representing tradition, is Ashlyn Laflame. And the new members of the Skulls of Seven are, representing loyalty and friendship, Catherine Bloom, representing honor, Michael Ellinger, representing citizenship, Cameron Gellert, representing service, Matthew Huffman, representing scholarship, Anna Costner, and finally representing history, the baby skull is William Martin. Congratulations to all of the new members of the Skulls of Seven. Congratulations, how exciting. And thank you, Dr. Jones, for all of that. Uh, what great news. All right, our final portion of the academic awards ceremony is uh, the Undergraduate Scholars Awards. We had judges working very hard over the last week to get the judging completed in the categories of best paper, best poster, and best recorded presentation. And I'm very happy to announce the winners today. In the category of best paper, goes to Jacob Gibson for the War on Terror and the Problem of Indefinite Detention. Congratulations, Jacob. The Best Poster Award goes to Colette Fayella for preliminary taphonomic interpretations of a triceratops from the Grand River National Grasslands, South Dakota. Congratulations. And, the fi and finally, in the category of Best Recorded Presentation, the award goes to Elena Cisneros for Do Woolly Bear Caterpillars 
predict the weather. What a great presentation. Thank you all and congratulations. Excellent work. All right, as we wrap up this session, I do need to thank just a few people. Uh, first of all, thanks to our presenters and our faculty who worked so hard to get them ready. I am so sorry about all the many email messages you got from me so that we got this day in perfect order. I won't email you again. It's been a great, great day so far and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Special thanks to the Teaching and Learning Committee for all their work. Uh, the Education Association and Alpha Chi members who are here assisting us all day today. Deepest thanks go to the Stubbs family for their generous support of the Undergraduate Scholars Forum year after year after year. And I have to say, I'm going to slow down here for just a second. There's a person who has been the backbone of the Scholars Forum for at least a dozen years. She's retiring and we have to say something special about Angela Grogan. Because Angela Grogan holds the details of the Scholars Forum like no one I've ever seen before. She makes sure we don't forget anything. She keeps us going with her great sense of humor and her pictures of her grandchildren. And she pushes us to make the Scholars Forum better every single year. We're so sad that she's retiring, but I don't know how we're gonna do the Scholars Forum without you in the future, Angela. This is gonna be a fun challenge. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for all you've meant to this event over the years. Yeah, round of applause for Angela Grogan. And then finally, uh, just a couple more things. You all are amazing for being here students. Sorry, faculty and staff, you don't get the prizes, but we will have a drawing for students who are here this morning. And if you will attend two more sessions and then go online, you will see that there's a form to fill out so that you can be considered for the grand prizes. So please do that today. And then join me today at uh, three o'clock for our closing uh, celebration, ice cream social on the Sloss Hall patio. So that's, that's the events for the day. Hope you all can enjoy uh, every session and thank you so much for your support. Bye-bye.